start again and so forth until I can get that resolved. Okay, so basically this module is on decision trees. Actually, before we start, does anybody have any questions they want to go through first? I'll hold time for questions at the end as well if you want. Okay, um, as far as Hofstra is concerned, um, the latest I heard is they're still planning on opening on the 23rd, but we're prepared to do the rest of the semester online. So to that end, I'm gonna continue doing the Zooms like I normally do. You'll need to stay in contact with me as much as possible, especially if you're running into difficulties. It's going to cause a few delays. It already has in terms of getting things ready and uh, able. I'm gonna try and do some pre-recordings as well so that you'll have that and you can take a look uh, prior to joining uh, the session. So hopefully we can you know, muddle through this as easily as possible. Uh, if anybody's got any questions or comments, just let me know on Slack. All right, so we're gonna continue the topic on uh, classification algorithms. We're gonna talk about decision trees. Decision trees are basically a way to take a large set of data and split them down into these, what are tree looking type of uh, structures. Uh, normally what we're doing here is, in this case, we have what's called basically a binary tree where every leaf or every node, I'm sorry, has uh, two extensions off of it, right? So we'll have two nodes off of this node. This node has two nodes, and if they're at the very bottom, they're called leaves. So we have decision nodes and we have leaf nodes. So the decision node will have two or sometimes more branches. In a binary tree, you're only gonna have two. Uh, if they have more, which is possible, it's a different type of tree. Now, it can handle both categorical as well as numerical data. So there's no assumption of the type of data that goes in. And in fact, the response variable can both be categorical and it could be continuous as well. So think about what that means. I, if we ran a regression equation, right, we could run a regression equation where we predict income. Well, I can use a decision tree to do the exact same thing and it will predict income. Or more likely than not, I wanna use decision trees to predict a classification. So if we have high, medium, and low risk, we may wanna predict what the risk is going to be. In this case, uh, to the right, this is basically a survival or die type of model, usually for uh, various viruses, uh, coincidentally enough, based on what's going on. Now, there are a number of different algorithms that are used for decision trees. So when you run a decision tree, you, you basically have different types of algorithms. And they have different characteristics, they have different speed performances in terms of how they split the data, create the branches, and so forth. Uh, a couple of the ones are what's called ID3, which is an iterative dichotomizer. Basically, the dichotomizer is basically uh, creating a dichotomy between various nodes. So it's just a two-way split. The C45 extends ID3. We're actually gonna be using an extension of that called C50. Uh, CART, which is a classification and regression tree uh, type of uh, algorithm, and we'll talk about that one too. Random forests actually creates multiple trees, and what it does is it takes a large set of data, takes a sample, creates a tree, takes another sample, creates a tree, takes another sample, creates a tree, and sometimes you'll have data that overlaps. The reason it's doing that, and that's why it's called a forest, because it's multiple trees, is it's going to aggregate all the information and determine which ones are the best in terms of the items. Uh, you can't hear anything. Can anybody else, everybody else hear me okay? Hello? Yeah, yeah yes, I can hear you. Okay. All right, uh, Derek, I'm sorry, if that's you, probably on your audio side. All right, um, so, the, so that's what random forests are. Uh, Chide is, or Chade is basically a chi-squared automatic inter, uh, interaction detector. It has multiple level splits. We won't be doing this, nor will we be doing the MARS, which is an adaptive regression spline, but we will be doing something called conditional inference, which is a statistics-based approach to split the data. Again, this is all about splitting the data into that tree. Uh, we're gonna be working with three algorithms. We're gonna be working with R part, which is like CART. We're gonna be working with C50 and we're gonna be working with the conditional inference. And we're gonna show the differences between them. You don't have to develop an algorithm or anything, you could just basically plug it in. And the idea is to understand that each algorithm is gonna be sensitive 
to certain aspects of the data. All right, so our decision tree, our goal basically is this classification tree. Close the chat window. And we wanna figure out what is actually happening. So it needs to provide a means by which the data can be classified from the attributes. So here, this is uh, basically determining acceptability of a car. Oh, someone's gonna chat, let's see. Uh, okay, yeah, sorry, Derek, but uh, it is recorded, so you'll be able to get it on YouTube if, you, if you're still running into problems. You can, by the way, if you want, you can join via phone. Hold on one second, I will get you the phone, as soon as I can find it. Uh, where's the invitation, right, there we go. Copy invitation. Derek, in the invitation, uh, I've posted the actual phone number so you could actually call by phone if you're having audio problems. So this way you can follow along. Um, so this is a data set that we're gonna be working with in a few minutes or when we're through with the slides. And we have basically acceptable or unacceptable as the code or as the category. Uh, there is uh, actually four categories. There's very good, there's acceptable, unacceptable, and good. So those are the four categories based on the attributes of this car. So buying is the buying price, maintenance is the price of maintenance, the number of doors, the capacity in persons, the lug boot, and the safety, the safety uh, estimated safety of the car. What we're trying to do is determine in terms of a buyer preference, is it acceptable, unacceptable, good, or very good? And so it's a four level classification based on these attributes. So we're gonna start with the cart method. And basically the nodes are split into exactly two branches. It recursively partitions the records in the training data with similar values. So what it's gonna do is it's basically gonna split all the data recursively. What we mean recursively is um, a recursive function is one in which you call a function and then you call the function again using the subset of data. So there's an, uh, an example which is the factorial. If you remember something like factorial, I'm going to annotate on the screen here. So if you remember five factorial, right, and I'll, I'll draw it like this, f of x equals x factorial, okay? And basically what that means is I could, uh, if I want to do five factorial, this is equal to five times four times three times two times one. Now, in computer science or in algorithms, we, a recursive function is one in which it calls itself. So you might be able to recognize that if f of x is the factorial function and we're trying to call five factorial, well, what that really basically means is if I were to do f of five, that would be the same thing as five times f of four. Okay, does everybody see that? And then f of four would be equal to four times f of three. And f of three is equal to three times f of two. And f of two is equal to two times f of one. And then we have our base case, which is the final piece, f of one is just equal to one. This is what's known as a recursive uh, formula, a recursive equation, because I can use the function within the function itself. So five, five factorial is the same thing as five times four factorial. Four factorial is the same thing as four times three factorial, and so forth and so forth and so forth. And so that's what's occurring in terms of what CART, the CART methodology does. So what it does is it requires your target variable. In, in this case, we're gonna talk about that ACC variable. And we're gonna give it a training set. That's why we studied training sets the last time. And we're gonna basically use that training set to predict what the test set would be, what the actual categories of acceptability will be in the test set. So that's what we're looking for. Now, if we're gonna use CART, the classification attribute must be discrete. In other words, the response variable or my target variable needs to be a discrete variable, it needs to be categorical. So it's gonna be either yes or no, or acceptable, unacceptable, very good, good, and so forth, okay? All right, now, so this is what this is gonna look like. How are the decision trees selecting the nodes and the splits? The leaf nodes of the tree are decided as the set of data with the highest possible possibility of similarity. So when it figures out its splits, 
for the at the very top node. It says, you know what? If you have four or more persons, we're going to go to the left because I, I need to still split it out. But if you are not four or more persons, which would basically be two, basically what happens is it comes down into this node and says, you know, everybody who is at two uh, is pretty much unacceptable. These nodes down here are the final output of the decision tree algorithm. So in this case, the top line is basically telling you uh, the classification, the, the most likely classification, which in this case is unacceptable. These four numbers are the probability of the four levels. So you have acceptable, uh, good, unacceptable, and very good. And the way you know this is, we'll talk about this as a factor. This variable of the ACC variable is a factor and it's in alphabetical order. So that's how you can realize what these numbers are if you had, I just lost my mouse, which is not good. Uh, hold on a second, I just lost my mouse. <laughs> Can't click it. Okay. There we go. Okay. So that's how I know that these four items, because these are the four levels, and if I look at the variable that I'm targeting, they will be in alphabetical or numerical order. So in this case, the unacceptable has 100% of the data uh, in in its uh, in the box. This 33% represents 33% of all of the data. So at this node, 33% of all of the data will be unacceptable from this leaf. 22% will be unacceptable from this leaf. So, and this top node is 100%. If you look at the node numbers up here, at the very beginning, when I just put the data into the algorithm, you end up with 22% being acceptable, 4% being good, 70% being unacceptable and 4% being very good. So that's how you read this chart. And that's what we're looking for. The algorithm will then determine the optimal splits to get you uh, the predictions at the leaf nodes. Now, at the end of the tree, we, can, we don't have any more splits. In other words, it's basically said, I can't split this anymore to get better. So we have a certain classification error. The leaf nodes, we'll have a certain probability of error because we can't split it anymore. There's no reason to or I can't get any more information out of it. Thus, the classification error rate for the leftmost leaf node here is 50%. Now, why is it 50%? So if you look at this tree, you know, for this person's four or more, yes, it comes down, it looks at the safety variable as high or medium. Yes, it goes to the left. It says, okay, if it's medium, go to the left. If it's not medium, go to the right. And then I can start looking at doors. The algorithm determines the optimal set of splits. So you don't have to tell it what to split first. It's doing all of that for you. When I look at the leaf nodes down here, at three or four, three, four or five more or more doors, it comes to this left node and says, okay, this classification is gonna be acceptable. 50% of the resulting data is acceptable. That means my classification error is the sum of these three numbers, which in this case is 49, but it really could be 50% because it's a 50-50. You're, you're gonna miss a percentage for rounding. It's the rounding error that occurs. And it represents 17% of all of the data. In other words, when you come down through here, 17% of the data followed this path. If I did doors three, four, five or more, and the answer is no, it's not that, well, then the classification listed is unacceptable. 57% uh, of the time that was unacceptable. And my classification error here is 36 plus 0 0.06, which is 42. But if you want to make it up to 100, it'll be 43. And that's what it's saying here. The classification error for this, 50%. Classification error for this is 43%. Okay? Does that make, any, does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions so far? I have a quick question. Sure, go ahead. Um, can you go from uh, left to right with the numbers, what they mean? The, these numbers here? Yeah. Okay. So, and uh, Kate, you asked how you're getting the 50%. So I'll answer both at the same time. So you see this 0.50. The, the algorithm has basically said that, I'll close the chat window. 
that I'm going to split the data and I find that if persons are four or more, yes, I'm going to come to the left. And if safety is high or, uh, or medium, I come to the left. But specifically, if the safety was medium, then you can go to the left again. And oops. And if the doors are three, four, five, or more, we go to the left. That's how I get to this node. With that set of data that you have, okay? In other words, that meet all that criteria. The general classification is acceptable because the largest one of these numbers is the first one. And the first one in this case refers to acceptable. There are four levels of the classification variable. There's acceptable, there is good, there's unacceptable, and very good. The only way you would know this is you'd have to look at the data. I don't have it listed here, it's, it's listed in the data. Okay, so, and these numbers represent that if you got into this, you had a 50% chance of being uh, acceptable, 11% chance of being good, 38% chance of being unacceptable, and 0% chance of being very good. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And Kate, does that understand how we got the 50% here? Because this is 50%. And the classification error is one minus this, or the sum of these three numbers. So the sum of these three numbers is really 49, but what you're seeing is a rounding error. In other words, it rounded these to 49, and this may be a little bit more than 50%. So you could say 50 or 49% is the classification error. Does that make sense, Kate? They are always in the order always in the order of the variable values. In this case, the variable values for that target variable are acceptable, good, unacceptable, and very good. It's in alphabetical order. If, however, you had a classification that was high, low, and medium, the order would be uh, high, low, then medium, because H, it's H, L, and M. If you had a classification that was a rank, like a one, two, or three, it would be in the order of one, two, and three. Does that make sense? Okay, you got it. That's what I'm confused right now about this uh, one. Uh, the fifty percent is like a poll or something of the uh, data. That yep, people it's fifty percent like... of the data had an acceptable value. In other words, the remember the data is asking whether or not buyers thought the car was acceptable. Okay, that's what the data says. So fifty percent thought that it was acceptable. 11% thought it was good. 38% thought it was unacceptable. And 0% thought it was very good. And out of all these people, there's a people at four or more high to medium safety with three to four or five doors. And that's 50%. Correct. Correct. 50% of the people, if you followed that path, 50% mm -hmm. of the time, you would say that it was acceptable. I got it. Okay. And that represents, this node represented 17% of the entire data set. So if the entire data set was 100 observations, or let's say 1,000 observations, this would be 170 records in here. This would be 60 records in here. This would be 220 records, 220 records, 330 records. Does that make sense? How about the uh, top the doors? Is that like represent 22%? It's like 220, Here? yeah. Right, so 22% of the data fell in this area. If you look, right, this is 22% of all the data that fell under persons four or more. Safety was high or medium, specifically the safety was medium. And it was, uh, we got to that point before we did any more splits. That was 22% of the data. And if you look here, that you have 17 plus six, which is 23. Again, it's a rounding error. Oh, I got it now. Okay. Okay. All right. Now we have this concept of pruning. Pruning reduces the size of a decision tree by removing branches and nodes that really don't have as much predictive power when we're trying to classify that categorical variable. Okay. What it's doing is if you had a tree that had 20 levels or 15 levels, Right? We call these you know, different levels, one, level one, level two, level three, level four. Pruning allows you to reduce the size of the tree where you have no loss in accuracy. In other words, or very minimal loss in accuracy. 
because you could say, well, you know what, do I really need to go down as far as five, uh, seven or eight levels? Can I do just as good with the fourth level or just as good with the third level? So doing that is called pruning, and there are methods that you can use to do that. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to develop the first decision tree. And I'm going, to go, I'm going to start going back and forth to R, so just bear with me for one second. If you go into Blackboard, please, and you can download the, I'll find my Blackboard. Uh, you're going to download the decision tree code. And we'll get the data too. We'll have to get used to this. I'll have to make sure that I get the code up and running fast. Decision tree. And let's see where it's using the data. Oh, we're going on our freeze. Wait, wait. It's not downloading it. Too much stuff open. Do you guys have the data or uh, the uh, R code already? Hopefully, everybody has it. Uh, where do you find that? It's on the R code. This uh, the R code um, um, link on Blackboard. Got it. Okay. I can't seem to open it for some reason. Let's see if you can bring it up somewhere here. Got my downloads. There we go. It's not showing in my finder. Open with R Studio. I just got to reboot my R Studio for a second. Let's see if this opens up now. There we go. All right. So now I will share my screen again. Okay. So can everybody see my screen? Okay, hope so. All right. Now we're going to need a couple of libraries already. So I'm going to need this R part plot, R part, and reader. The only reason why I need reader is because reader is how I'm going to import the data set. That's all. So I'm going to run these three. Let's see if I have them installed. I've got it. I've got the R part, and I've got my reader package. So we're good. Now, what I'm going to do is we're going to use another data set here from the UCI website. So this is going to, now I've, what I'm doing is I'm combining things. So we've seen in previous code where I've done the read.csv from a URL. But what I'm doing is I'm encapsulating that in another function called as data frame so I can immediately convert it into a data frame. You could have this as two separate lines if you wanted to. That's not a, that's not a problem. I'm going to run this. It's got my data set. If I look at car, I'm going to run that. This is what car looks like. If I go up to the top, and I've got, it says, here's your column one, column two, column three, column four, column five, column six, and column seven. What I've done in line seven here is I've basically given you the names of the columns. So the first column is going to be buying, you know, buying price, maintenance price, doors, persons, lug boot, safety value, and ex the acceptable or unacceptable. When we run that, I can view car, and you will see that it looks nice. I've got my titles, and now I can work with it. Now, let me show you a couple of things. If we look at the environment here for car, you're going to notice, you're going to notice that each one of these text variables is listed as a CHR. That's a character string. We need to convert these into uh, categorical variables, okay? Because they're categories. 
the buying is going to be V high, V low, you know, whatever it is. Uh, the maintenance is going to be the same thing. Doors is going to be a categorical variable. It's two doors, four door, five door. Number of persons is going to be two door, two, three, four, or five and so forth for these other items. So what we're gonna do is we are going to make those variables a factor. We're gonna say, take that column, car, dollar sign buying, and turn it into a factor by saying, I want you to treat it as a factor. And we put it right back into the buying column, okay? So when I run this, you'll notice here on the right, in the environment, watch what happens to the type. It changes it to a factor. And it says it has a factor of four levels. So we, ultimately, we're gonna see what those levels are. I'm gonna show you in a second. But I'm gonna convert each one of the other variables into a factor as well. And now they're all as a factor. So let's take a look at the car buying. If you do something called levels, car dollar sign buying, you will notice that it's telling me the levels of that field. These are the possible values of the buying column in the car uh, data frame. High, low, medium, and very high. And they're in alphabetical order. And that is, remember, uh, I think, I don't remember who asked, but what the numbers were, the four numbers in the, in the decision tree, they will be in this order if this was the variable of interest. But in our case, the variable of interest is ACC. So I will change this, or I'll add this, to be ACC. And you'll see it's acceptable, good, unacceptable, very good. That will be the order of the nodes, of the percentages for the nodes. Does that make sense? Is everybody good with that? Any questions? All right. All right, so can someone tell me what I'm about to or what I'm trying to do here on line 18? I haven't completed it, but... What am I trying to do? Don't everybody raise your hand at once. Let's see who's who, who raised it again. Put random number, radium numbers. That's a new one, Andy, radium. But yes, you meant random, that's correct. I am gonna want to, why am I gonna do random numbers? Anyone? Come on. To split the data. Yeah, we're going to split and the data. Training. Correct. Okay. So now I have my car data set has, say, whoever that, well, yeah, to get a training set. My car data set has how many observations? Go ahead, same person if you can. Uh, looks like 1,700. Uh, look over in the data set. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, 1,728. Okay. So, observations. right. So I wrote 1700, but that's not really right because it should be based on 1728 observations. Now I'm going to create a training set. Should I create a continuous sequential training set or should I create a random training set? Uh, random. Random. Why random? Uh, it's not time dependent. Correct. It's not time dependent. And he, so here is where you would then create your training set and test set, and this should be random, correct. I'm gonna leave this, we're gonna continue on without this for now, we're just gonna continue on to the decision trees. Okay, so now we have our data, and you could either set it up with training and test set, or we can run it with the whole thing, which is pretty much what we're gonna do right now. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. And we're gonna basically run our example. So first we're going to develop the model, a tree model, and we're going to run this R part function. What I mean by develop the tree model is you'll notice up here in the first line of code, I'm creating a formula and I'm saying I want you to predict the accuracy by <laughs> doors. PowerPoint. Oh, sorry. Can't see it. Take a little getting used to with this navigation, I'll tell you that. Share. Thank you. And and thank you very much for, for pointing that out, whoever did, and speaking up. Got it now. Thanks. All right. 
So here I have the simple, I, what I'm doing is I'm gonna develop my tree by creating a formula, just like you would do in a linear regression. So the, the formula basically says, I want you to predict the ACC column by doors, persons, and safety. This is my simple model that I'm, now it doesn't have to be called simple model, be called whatever you want. And you may have model one, model two, model three, et cetera. So this is where you're developing the model. Sometimes you're gonna develop a larger model. Sometimes it doesn't work so well, so you develop a smaller one, and that's what you're going to do. What we will then do is we will then put that into the R part function. We're gonna develop the actual tree. We put in simple model, which is the formula. We put in the data, and then we'd say method equals class, because this is a classification algorithm. So we're gonna actually predict a categorical variable. I'll tell you how to predict a continuous variable in a few minutes when we get to that. That will give us an object that we can print out. And that's gonna be this print. We can actually print out the model and see what it looks like and get a summary of the total information. What we're then gonna do is we're gonna take that car fit uh, object that we created and we're gonna plot it. We're gonna see what it looks like. And then we have a fourth uh, option, which is to print the actual rules of the, of the trait. That if it's three or four or five or more persons, it does this, et cetera, et cetera. So let's take a look at what it is. Whoops. Going back to R. Stop share, share, R. There we go. Okay. So here's an example. I have all of the variables in my model. I'm going to run this one first. So we're going to run the full model. And I can run simple model because I'll use it a little bit later, but because this is just a variable. So I'm gonna start with the full model. We'll change this to be full model. The data is the car data set. Method is classification. So we'll run this. Now I'm gonna print the model. Ugh, look at this. This is a mess. Everybody agree? Kind of a mess. A lot of stuff here. So let's see what happens. I have 1,728 observations. This basically says, this is your node. So this is the first node. What is my split? Well, the first one is the root, but you'll see the other one is persons four or more. And basically it says you had 1,728 observations and we had 50, 518 that we considered actually as a loss. Loss is gonna be that didn't meet whatever criteria we were for the yes or the no. My overall percentages here are, um, the majority of the data set or the classification of the root node is unacceptable. If you remember the chart before, and I'll bring it up again in a minute as soon as I plot it, but the first node was unacceptable. And each of the four classifications were 22%, 4%, 70%, and another 4% for acceptable, good, unacceptable, and very good. And the tree is formed from all of this information down here. This is exactly what it, how, how it does it and tries to figure out what the, what the ultimate final rules are. Um, I can't stand it, so let's take a look at the plot because the plot is just so much nicer. And we wait, there's a stop sign there. There we go. I'm gonna have to stop share so that you can see this. Not very easy to see. but that is your chart, okay? Uh, it's hard to see this. There's, there's ways to zoom in, but we're not gonna keep this chart. This is a complete chart for all of the data, okay? And we can uh, create all the pieces and so forth, but this is just a little too complicated. There's so many different levels, but at each level you could determine whether or not it was acceptable, acceptable, unacceptable, and you can use colors to make the determinations as well in the plot. It is much, much easier to work with the plot than it is with the actual rules of the tree. Oops, let's go back to the R. Okay. I'm sorry, I wanna go back to the PowerPoint. Oh, I got some people in the chat. I'll get to you in one second. So, um, oh, okay. Can you can you guys see it now? 
Yeah. Okay. By the way, well, Andy, so, and I know someone did, I said it before. So if you can't see the PowerPoint, just interrupt. Don't send it via chat because the chats are a little bit harder for me to read because I, I have to hide it behind the PowerPoint. Okay. All right. So, so this is what we had talked about. This shows the level of the tree and the output of uh, each node. Again, each one of these represents a node. This represents the rule, total number of observations, the number that uh, were part of the classification, in this case, the unacceptable, and so forth. It goes one, it goes to the right, persons four or more, um, to the fourth node, to the eighth node, 16, and then it works its way back up. You're much better off working with the chart. And this model is gonna be for the simple model, or one of the models that we're gonna show you. Um, you'll notice here that we've got the unacceptable, here's my yes and no. And in this scenario here, 33% of all the data falls in here. And of that 33%, 100% are unacceptable. So that's, it's a good model to actually determine unacceptable because you'll know four or more is literally gonna be unacceptable. That's your best branch at that point. And that's what the plot method does. Okay, any questions on the C part algorithm? And when you interpret this for your, either your homework or your, uh, your in this case, your final, um, or is decision tree in the midterm? Decision tree is actually in the midterm. So in, in your midterm, um, what you're doing is you're looking at the classification tree to give you an interpretation, okay? As well as give you the prediction. So you might get a new set of data and you wanna predict what class will it be in, okay? And I'll show you how we do that when we do the predict method, which we'll do in a few minutes. Professor? Yep. Can you go back to the previous um, slide with all the numbers? Yes, that, that one. So, so it's saying that um, you had 1728 observations. Yep. And then, so number one, the root one, 518 were unacceptable. Yep. Were the unacceptable, correct. And then the 0.22 was acceptable? Uh, no, 22% uh, here are, uh, I'm sorry, this is the lost. Uh, um, this is not unacceptable. This is everything else. This is your um, classification error. This is the percentage of the classification error. Unex so the note is unacceptable because this is the highest number, right? The 70% here. Right. Okay. So the remaining is about 30%. Uh oh. Right? 518 is actually th about 30% of the 1,700. Do you see that? Hello? 30% 30, 30 because that because the third one was 70%. Right. So, so that adds up to 100%. Correct. And if you oh, get okay, okay. 22, five, you know, 4% is 26, and another four is roughly about 30%. Okay. Okay. okay? And okay, so this thank 518. You. Okay, I just lost my mouse again. This 518 represents the addition of these three variables. That makes sense? Yeah. Yes. I just have okay. another quick question. Yep, go ahead. So you have 1728, and then out of all the data, 518 fall within the root, and then- 518 are, uh, are your, is your classification error. In other words, unacceptable is the primary classification because 70% of all of your data is unacceptable. So 518 are something else. That's why this is your loss. Okay, so you lost that amount of data. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I don't like the word loss because it's really, you're not losing the data. It just means you, if the, um, if the classification of a node is X, the 512 will say like not X, anything that wasn't X. Those did not fit as unacceptable. They were something else. Gotcha. It's a, it's not a good term. Uh, I I think using the word loss, but that's what the that's what the documentation gives you. Okay. Okay. All right. So we did that. Whoops. All right. Now now we're going to talk about the C four five and C five zero algorithm. So this was developed uh, at, to create trees from the training data through something called information entropy. Information entropy is the information gained from a particular cause or an, or an event. So 
the more uncertain a random an event is, the more information it will contain. Consider being told something you already knew. The amount of information gained will be small. Well, let's take a look at this. So normally this would be a lot easier in class, but let's just say we were in class and I have a coin and I flip the coin and it's heads and I flip it again and it's heads and I flip it again and it's heads and I flip it five more times and it comes out heads. I'm gonna ask you, do you need me to keep flipping the coin in order to determine what the next value is gonna be or to predict what it's gonna be? Anyone? Come on, don't no. keep going. What'd you say? I said no, because you already have enough information. Right, so there's no more information gained uh, from the event. So there's no more entropy. I don't need to do it anymore. So let's take a different example. I know that I will take, you know, we'll take the current, the current uh, situation, right? We know a certain, a certain amount of people walk into the hospital. Some of them may or may not have this coronavirus. And I end up with, you know, five people coming in out of a hundred and then six people coming in out of a hundred, you know, and you're still not sure what the actual percentage and then 10 people come in out of a hundred and now you get four people come in out of a hundred. But at some point, you don't need to know how many people are coming in and how many have the disease in order to know what the probability is that they will have that particular disease. There's no more information gained in terms of determining you know the percentage of people that will actually have the disease. I, I've already got enough and I don't need any more. The algorithm works through this by adding more information in until it says, I don't need any more, I'm done, I can tell you exactly what it is. And that's how this algorithm works. It, this is a recursive algorithm and it basically looks like this. Well, it takes all the samples and puts them in the same class. So if so, it creates a leaf of that class. Um, then it looks at them and says, none of the features provided any information gain. Therefore, it creates a decision node at a higher level using the expected value of the class. In other words, what we're doing is we're saying, take all the information that you have, lump them into a class. Let's take one of the variables. Do I gain any information from that variable that I didn't have before? If so, you create a split. If not, you don't use that variable at all. Um, and you continue doing this iteratively until you end up with the most optimal set of splits. You don't have to do this, the algorithm will do it for you. And what it basically does is it examines its base case, it looks at every variable or attribute and finds how much information is gained when you split on that variable. Then what it does is it takes the, all the variables and determines which one is the best one, and it will create a node from that split. And it does this over and over again until it exhausts all possibilities. That's how this algorithm works. And by the way, it's kind of what you would do if you were given a bunch of puzzles and you take, or a bunch of puzzle pieces, and you look at a certain set of puzzles, you start looking at certain elements that will give you more information to solving the puzzle, such as edges or parts of the picture that look the same that you can say, hey, I'm gonna put these together. That's, it's basically an ordering algorithm. It kind of orders things together and says, based on these variables, this is what I'm going to do. The reason C5.0 is there is because it extends off of 4.5 and it improves it in a lot of areas. So the first one is it's much faster, okay? The C5.0 is actually a faster algorithm. It uses less memory, it is smaller, and so it will produce similar results but using a smaller tree, which is actually good. It also allows for something called boosting, which we won't go into. We don't do that here in, in this class. Um, waiting, where I can wait the different cases and misclassifications. Again, I can, uh, we're not gonna do that here. And something called winnowing, which is to uh, remove attributes that may be ultimately irrelevant to the tree design. So it will rem remove them and then populate, them, uh, populate the tree again with only what's remaining. We are going to use the C5.0 algorithm in, uh, in R here. So this is kind of what the code looks like. It's a little bit similar. We have um, a case here where we, we need the 5.0 library, C5.0. Uh, we have our simple model, which we already had before. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna basically put into the C5.0 function that same model. I can basically do um, simple mod the simple model, but C5.0 won't take it as a 
uh, as a model object, you actually have to write this out. And we pass in the data and it will give us the rule and we're gonna do the same thing. We'll take a summary and we'll plot it. But it, notice the chart that it gives us looks a lot different. Before we only had two branches, we couldn't do anything else. But here I actually have for safety, I actually have three branches. I have a high, a low, and a medium. And we can interpret each one of these uh, as the probability of one of the particular levels. So we'll take a look at what that looks like. So let's go back to R. Find it. Okay. All right. Where's my R? There we go. Okay. So I'm going to run the library C50. Is everybody with me? Can you see the screen? Yeah, we can see it. Good. I'll take it as a yes. Um, so I take C50. Now what I'm going to do is I have to put in the object. Again, it will not take the, the simple model object that we created above. So we actually need to type this out. So we put this, uh, we're doing accessory uh, acceptable by doors, persons, and safety. We pass in the car object. I run, whoops, I run the whole thing, the whole line, and I get my model. And it basically tells me, okay, here's your classification trait. You've got three predictors, 1,700 uh, samples, your tree size is five, okay? That's what the rule model says. When I do the summary, you're gonna see a lot of information here, okay? So first, it basically says, uh, class specified by attribute outcome. In other words, this is the outcome uh, ACC. It labels that as an outcome variable, categorical, not a continuous. Red 17 cases has four total attributes, which is uh, the accessory has four attributes to it. Now, the decision tree, it starts with persons, uh, where it says 576 is your, this is, should be your loss. So let me do, let me just run this again. I want to run the plot because it's going to be easier for you to see the plot. If I can get to the plot. Okay. Can you all see the plot there? Okay. Yes. All right. So persons two, uh, persons equals two. I'm going to have, and it's hard to see here because this, see this 576, right? This is the number of people that are in this node to the left. It's a little bit different than the R part where it was the, the what they considered the loss. Here, it's when we split it up into the, into the left side, it's giving you what the, uh, what the N is on that case. We're not doing the, we're not giving you the loss anymore. C50 is not doing that. Um, then, where is my C50 here? Yeah, I'm doing the output. Okay, so now it goes down to persons in four or more. So it drops down to this category and says, okay, now you're going to look at the safety. And it says, I split safety up into three parts, high, low, and medium. So here, you'll notice that it's got uh, total for safety was 384. And it says, where is the acceptable? Where are you? 384, 384. Oh, where'd that 180 come from? I have to look. I don't remember where this 180 come, came from, but it's three. The, the acceptable is down here for high. Bear with me one second. The way we read the chart here is this. Uh, it's 384 and then 180 are, are not in the total in the total note. So 180 are, uh, are acceptable. The remaining is not in this case. So we have here, this is refer referencing, the four lines here are acceptable, good, unacceptable, and very good. And you can see here that the acceptable is roughly about 58% or 59, 57%. In this node down here, we had a total of 384, and all of them, 100% here, are gonna be in the unacceptable range. I know it says acceptable here, but when you split these out, it begins to put the labels on. It's unfortunately a bad design or, or bad uh, uh, way to doing, of doing the chart. Uh, so you really have to know what the 
tick marks here are for and what it's associated with. So here, 100% of this node is considered unacceptable. When we move safety as medium, we can then look at the doors node. And in the doors node, I have two, when you have two doors, again, the third one here is unacceptable. About 60% of these of the nodes here are going to be unacceptable. And about 40% are gonna be unacceptable. In the three, four, five, I have a little bit worse of a scenario because now of all the nodes that are here, I have about 50% that are acceptable and about 40% or so that are unacceptable and the remaining roughly 10% are gonna be in the good range, but none are here. So you can use this again to predict whether or not the classification of a car is going to be acceptable, unacceptable, very good or good. Uh, Question. Go ahead, Andy. Uh, is this like the other chart where you start with 1728, you subtract 50, 576 and you move on to three and you start measuring the 1200 people and you split them into 384, 384 and it whatever does, you made. In, in, in principle, it's the same thing, but they're, they're, you're getting reported slightly different numbers. It's reporting it a little differently. The other problem is, is that the charts are not the same. Okay, so you had persons, safety, look, you have a high, low, medium as a tri-split, right? Uh -huh. In other words, it's splitting it into three. And if you look at the previous chart, I hope if I can get there. No, it's, not, it's not running the smaller plot because I didn't run it yet. Let me run the smaller plot for you. Okay, this would be a smaller plot with the same attributes. You see how I have more levels, uh -huh. okay? But in the chart that we did in, the, in this interval, that safety one, which is really one of the key differentiators here, is yeah. split into three pieces, okay? Uh -huh. You will not necessarily get the same chart, nor will you necessarily get the same answer, but they should be generally in the same direction. In other words, it is possible to get splits that are different from our part and C5O and the other one, conditional inference. But in general, if you have a lot of data that goes to uh, unacceptable, you're gonna see some of the same attributes show up in, in the other methods, in all the methods as well. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So your trees won't look, uh, uh, they will not look the same, but they will have general characteristics that will be similar. Okay. I have a question. Yep. So the C5O model is intelligent enough to know to split it by two and then four or more? Yep. The same way, like it could have split safety with low and medium the same if it had, it, if both of those were, say, unacceptable or had the same outcome? Yep. It, it, would know, it knows how to split them. That's correct. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Stop sharing. All right, and the last one is the conditional inference tree. And this is similar to the regular decision trees, but this is the only one that uses a statistical test to determine variable selection rather than based on maximizing information entropy. Um, it is, I did it again, didn't I? Well, you should get a refund, man. I'm not the smartest tool in the shed here. All right, can you see it now? Good now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, guys, I, I need you to, to tell me and stuff like that because I don't, uh, I can't tell if you can see it or not. All right, um, so this is the only one that uses statistical tests to determine variable selection, okay? Um, but it, it is very similar in the way it, produced, it produces the tree. It basically creates a splitting of a particular variable. And again, you might get different nodes and leaves. What I mean by splitting is it's gonna take a variable, determine if there's a significance to the variable in terms of a statistical significance, and if so, it then determines the optimal split. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use the C tree package. And what it does is it's using a covariate scheme based on selection 
by permutation-based significance test. And what that basically means is we're selecting based on a different a number of combinations and determining which splits are significant, if any. And if they are, it creates a tree from it. By using the statistical test, it eliminates some bias, which you have in our part, and therefore we can remove that bias. The bias occurs when you have a little bit more, or a little bit less of one particular variable and says, I am forced to, to split something, so let me go split it. And, and then it does, but then which one is really better or not? Uh, it's just based on having one or more observations, which is not necessarily the best way to do it. So to do the C tree or the conditional inference tree, we do something pretty much we did before. I create my model. Here's my C tree. I put in the model and then I will plot it. Okay. And this looks a little bit different. You're going to notice that now it starts with safety and then it goes to persons and then it went back to safety. It says, okay, if safety was high or medium, then look at persons. If it's four or more, go back to safety and then split on the higher medium. This is a very different tree. So let's take a look at this back in R. Stop share. Where's my conditional inference tree? Here we go. So we're gonna have the, everybody's got a parte. So we're gonna library party. I can't gonna, see the uh, professor. All right, go ahead. No, nope, I'll get you. Thank you. You guys are gonna get really sick of that too. Sorry. There we go. Okay. All right. So I loaded the library party. So hopefully you have that. And then I'm going to run my model. Okay. I'll bring this back here this way so that you can see it all on one line. Okay. So I run the model again at the, ex the acceptable with doors, persons, and safety. I will run this model and then I will do my output. And you'll notice, oops, you'll notice that the output is very different than the ones we did before. It's giving you a very different tree. First of all, if safety is low, unacceptable is 100%. And the p-value here is the statistical significance of the variable split. So it's not gonna give you something that's over 0.05, okay? Otherwise it wouldn't belong in the tree, but it's telling you what the p-value was anyway. There are ways to change that p-value if you wanna accept things that are say at a p equals or less than 0.1, you could do that too. Here, if, I, if the safety is high or medium, and the number of persons is two, then my unacceptable is 100% of this number. And if it's four or more persons, then I go back to the safety, and I'm splitting it into the high and medium safety. And we could say that the acceptable here is about 55% or so forth, and then unacceptable is around 20% with everything else uh, lower than about 15 and 10%. And this is the conditional inference tree. Again, each one of the trees will give you a slightly different or somewhat different um, a splitting. And it's up to you to determine then which one is better. The way we're gonna do that is we're gonna develop accuracy measures between the training set and the test set. So we do the same thing that we did before. We will create our training set, which is 80% of the data, and the remaining 20% will be uh, attributed to the test set. What we'll then do is we're gonna then predict the classification of our test set based on the decision tree. And we will then compare the uh, accuracy rates using a contingency table in order to assess the better method. So let's take a look at how we do this, okay? Um, I'm going to need this library HMISC for something a little bit further down. Uh, gotta find out where the hell it is. Not really sure where it is, but I'll find it when it comes down to it. So we'll run this library. Now I'm gonna just get my total, total rows in the data set. And I'm gonna get the, the row names is the car ID so that I can basically hold on to this. So what they did was I created a column here called ID. All this is is just an ID for each row because I'm gonna use that a little bit later. Here what I'll do is I will basically pick a random number, uniform random number from one to total rows. And I'm gonna basically pick rows and I round it, okay? So let's take a look at this. Total rows is the total number of rows in the data set and I multiply this by 0 0.80, okay? 
I'm going to basically do run if from this to this. Run this. You see, I get a whole bunch of numbers here, right? I'm then going to round it to no decimal places. What this will do is this is giving me a random set of numbers from this one to, uh, you know, uh, the one to my 1,780% of it, I should say, so that I can basically pick out what I want. I will then take the pick rows. These are the rows that I'm going to have. And I'm going to basically you put that into training set. And if I do minus pick rows, it will, you can put that into the test set because it would be the rows that were not picked. So when I run this, pick rows got there. There we go. We'll take a look at the uh, training car. So there's my test car, which train car? 1382 observations. Test car is 785 observations. And by the way, this is just another way to do this. You could do it however you want. You could have, in, in, could you have selected the first eighty percent? Yes. Would it be more? At, would it be accurate? No. This is more accurate. But again, uh, it's how you select your your training set. So now what we're going to do is we're going to run this cart method. Same thing. I'm going to do ACC doors person safety, and then I will put it into the model. We run this. Now my model is complete. I have, it's, now, it's now run, I haven't plotted it or anything like that, but I'm gonna now predict. I'm gonna predict what classification my test set is. So we're gonna use that predict function again. The model that we just did, which is car fit two from here, my data is gonna be test car, and my type is classification because it's gonna predict one of the four classes. When I run this, my test car here, now has a predicted class. The class that it was was unacceptable. The predicted class was unacceptable. And you'll see here was the, the, the actual was unacceptable. My predicted class was unacceptable and so forth. Does that make sense to everybody? We're good? Can I get one yay? Yes. Awesome. Is anybody not okay with that? Okay, all right, I'll move on. Again, if it's not okay, you gotta tell me. So now we're gonna create the contingency table. Contingency table is like a two column table. So let me just show you what it looks like and then I'll come back to it. If I run that line 114 and I click on that, you'll see it gives me what looks like this. The contingency table is basically the counts of when I said it was acceptable versus when it was acceptable. When, so the test car is your rows, okay? These are the, what we want it to be. And the, this is the uh, acceptable, the actual columns. This part is the predictions, okay? So we predicted a lot of these acceptables and a lot of unacceptables, and we predicted no goods and no very goods. And the real one that we had a problem here was this one. There was about uh, 109 that we predicted were ac acceptable, when they were really unacceptable. There were 33 that were good when we said they were acceptable, and there were 28 that were very good when we said that they were acceptable. So there are some issues with the model. However, Questionnaire. Yep. is everybody gonna get a different answer? Because I just ran it a long view, and yep. I got totally different numbers. When you say long view, what do you mean? The entire, mo all the variables? Uh, I'm been copying along in R and been running the uh, same lines. Mm -hmm. I got acceptable 158, if, and then uh, it could be based on your 19. It could be based on your training set. Okay. Okay, because that part was random. Uh -huh. Okay. The next I have a question. one. Yeah, go ahead. Shoot. Um, so when you're looking at that matrix, the columns are the predicted, and the rows okay. are the actual. Correct. Here's why. If you look at a table. This this table statement that I did, the first one oh, is the okay. rows, the next one is the columns. Got it. Okay. Thanks. So now the next lines here, this line gives me the dimension names. Uh, again, I just this is a way to give me some uh, a little bit of a nice um, uh, output. See that predicted an actual. <laughs> 
And then the next three lines can compute it as a percentage. Okay, um, I'm not gonna go through the calculations. Uh, you can kind of go through that where it takes the value and divides it by the sum of the whole thing and you can get your percentages, which look, make it look like this, okay? There are different ways to represent that. So that's one, that's how I get the prediction for the R part. Now what I'll do is I'll do the same thing for the C5O algorithm. I'll take the C5O algorithm, I'll plug in my formula, run it against the training set here, and then I do the prediction. When I look at the prediction, here is my table counts. And you'll see it looks a little bit different. I now have a little bit classification error here. Um, this looks good, but th and this reduced a little bit. Does that make sense? The classification table is what's gonna tell us based on the hit rate of how well we did. The hit rate being these percentages. Now the final one we'll do is the conditional inference. I'll run the C-tree algorithm again with the exact same model with the training set. I will then call the predict. The only difference here when I call predicts is I, I need to put in response as the type. It's the only difference. There we go. I will get my counts display, and here are my counts. And it looks pretty much similar to the other one that we had done in the R part. So they're a little bit different. So I have put all that together for you here. In the, well, you can't see it because I didn't click share. See, I remembered this time. All right, here's what the results look like, okay? As percentages. So the C part has my percentages here for actual and uh, for the uh, acceptable and unacceptable. And you can see here that your C5O seemed to do pretty well over here with the uh, 0.916. The conditional inference pretty much had the same values uh, in terms of the percentages. And both of them are roughly gonna be the same and any differences could be based on the uh, training set and test set that you had taken, okay? This would be an example of you know, when, I, when I ran it another time. The random numbers will give you slightly different results all the time. This is how you would determine which method is actually better based on how well it did against the training set. You could actually provide how well it did against the, uh, sorry, the test set. How well does it do against the training set and how well does it do against the test set and then make a determination. But the key is how well did it do against the test set? Because that's the data that the model has not seen. Does that make sense? Any questions on measures of accuracy? Uh, professor, can you go? Over the, the numbers again. Um, These? Uh, yeah, the, let's say on the C part, the 0. 0.860. Yep. That means 86% um, of the time we predicted an acceptable and it wasn't acceptable. And then 14% of the time we predicted unacceptable, but it was actually accessible, acceptable. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Now you can do something called a regression tree. A regression tree will actually predict the continuous or a continuous variable. Everything is the same. The, the only difference is, there's two little differences. Number one is my dependent variable is a continuous variable and I'm going to change the method to say ANOVA. This is gonna give me an, a, what uh, would be an ANOVA analysis. The partitioning is achieved based on any of the predictors that you have. So in this case, we're trying to predict MPG. And here, this is the way we would interpret the, the, the tree, the, one of the leaves of the tree. If the weight is greater than 2580, it comes to the left. It says 27, are, uh, 27 is the mean. 8% of the total is actually, uh, is actually in this bucket. But this now represents not a percentage, but an average, uh, an average for that bucket. That means if the weight was greater than 2580, the average mile per gallon was 27. If the weight is less than 2580, we come to this side, the average M miles per gallon was 33. So the decision tree is only giving you the average of the node. Does that make sense? Any questions? 
So when that's true, like weight greater than 2580, it's the true is always going to be on the left? Yes. Yes and true is always to the left. Okay. Okay. But does that make sense? How that it's, what it's really doing is it's predicting which uh, side, left or right, the data should go. And then it averages the actual miles per gallon and says, this is what the average would be for that node. If you fall in that node, that's how it's predicting. Because the average would be a good estimate of everything in there. Does that make sense? So in regression trees, how do we determine you know, accuracy? So here's something that this looks like. So I have in this case, the displacement greater than 191, it comes to the left. Horsepower greater than 127, it comes to the left. So the average of displacement greater than 191 with horsepower greater than 127 is 15. But if the displacement is greater than 191 and the horsepower is greater than 71, uh, then it comes down here and your miles per gallon again goes, if the model year is less than 79, the weight is 2305, the miles per gallon is 22. So each one of these nodes is telling you the average mile per gallon. So you can just follow the tree and determine based on these attributes, what is the average miles per gallon. What you would then do is just like we did in the machine learning uh, module, we calculate the accuracy measures by measuring the error, mean absolute error, percent error, absolute percent error, and the mean absolute percent error. In the exact same way, we take our predictions, we compute the error from the actual, the mean absolute error, we compute a percent error, the absolute percent error, and the mean absolute, and then we compute the mean absolute percent error. Let me go back to R. I'm gonna share the screen again. All right. And in the bottom of the code here, we're gonna do the ANOVA tree again. I'm gonna read the table. This is the, the uh, a different data set, auto miles per gallon. So we're gonna read this data. I'm gonna give it its header and I'm gonna convert it to a new frame. So you're gonna notice here, I've done, this in two, um, I've done this in two lines instead of one like I did up above. And my new car's uh, data set looks like this, 398 observations, nine rows. I have miles per gallon, cylinders, displacement, horsepower, et cetera. So what I have to do is you're gonna notice in new cars that there are probably a few question marks somewhere. So this is gonna be a problem with the data, so we should look at the data first. This will remove them, I'm gonna make them, I'm gonna turn them into what's called NAs, not applicable, they'll be nulls. Oops, not on that. And now I'm gonna get complete cases. Give me only the complete cases. If there's an NA, get rid of it. Horsepower, I will convert as numeric. Why am I doing that? Because if you look at horsepower over here, in the new cars data set, you're gonna notice that horsepower is listed as a factor because of those question marks. It thought it was a character when it imported it. So it turned it into a factor. So what we need to do is we need to convert it to a numeric. Now that I got rid of the question mark, I can convert it to a numeric. Since it's a factor, and, and you probably need to go through this on the video, uh, or repeat it. Since this is a factor, I first have to convert the factor into a character set. This will convert it from just like a one, two, or three, because if you had like New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York would be one, LA would be two, Chicago would be three, actually be in reverse order. So it takes the character. So now it actually has the representation of nine zero point zero. So these were characters, nine zero point zero zero nine five. Converts it to character, then you convert it to numeric. And when you do that, you'll see over here, the horsepower is now a number, which is what you want. So this is about cleaning the data in this case. And this is a little bit kludgy in R. Now, once you do that, we're gonna run our R part. Notice at the right, we have our method equals ANOVA. I will give it the formula, cylinders, displacement, horsepower, weight, acceleration, model year. So I can run this. I will get my summary, which is again now very similar to what we had seen before, but this is a mess to read. So we'll just plot it. When I plot it, here's my miles gallon prediction. And this is very similar to the chart that we had seen before. 
if the displacement is greater than 191, yes, and the horsepower is greater than 127, it's probably a monster car. The average is 15. My average mile per gallon is 15. I can go to the right side if the displacement is greater than 191, no. Horsepower is greater than 71, no. And the model year is greater than 78, no. Then the miles per gallon is 30, or I'm sorry, this is model year is less than 78, no. Then the miles per gallon looks like it's 36 at that point. And that's how we read the trade. I can go back on that same data set that I had before and do the prediction. I can predict what the values of miles per gallon are. So when I run this, I've now created a new column called predict DT inside of the new car's uh, data frame. So you'll see over here that it's given me a prediction of the miles per gallon. So the miles per gallon here is 18, 15, 18, 16. My prediction for those items are 14, 14, 14, 14. You'll see there are different down below. We're gonna have some error in it, which is okay. We need to measure them. So here, this computes my error. It's the predict minus the actual, or I could do actual minus predict, it'll give me the same thing. And I'm rounding it to three decimal places. That's my error. I will take the absolute value of the error, rounding it to three decimal places. Should we do that? Gotta run this. I will then get the absolute error percent. Now, let's compare what happens. If I, if I take that down here, where was I? Right here. If I take the mean of the error, you get a very small number, which is what I would hope for. So let's take the mean of the absolute error. And I'll run that. So the mean absolute error is about 2.2. So I'm off by about two miles per gallon, plus or minus in either direction. And I could compute the mean of the percent. And it's about 10% off. Uh, sorry, I just lost my screen. There we go. Now, some of you might ask, well, which is better? Is regression better or is decision tree better for the prediction? So let's find out. We're gonna run a standard regression using the same variables, cylinders, displacement, horsepower, weight, acceleration, model year. I'm gonna run it against the same data. Here's my summary. So I've got some variables here that should get removed, but for this exercise, I'm not gonna remove it, okay? Okay, all right, I'll take a look, cool. thanks. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna run the prediction for that, uh, model and, and data. I'm gonna compute my error the same way, the absolute error and the absolute error percent. And now if I want, let's calculate the mean. Yep. Let's do the mean of the errors. Which is again, close to zero, which is what I would hope for. We're gonna do the mean of the absolute errors, which is about 2.61. And then I'm gonna do the mean of the percent of the absolute percent error, which is about 12%. So what's funny is, is that it's looking like the decision tree in this case did a little bit better than the uh, regression model. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna try and figure out, well, who won? Did the prediction win or did the linear model win? So this here is a Boolean uh, condition. Is the absolute percent error less than or equal to the absolute error from the linear model? This is gonna give me a bunch of true or falses. I'm gonna put that into this variable, dt win, and figure out if it won or not. Then all I need to do, if you take a look at the new cars and you look at this dt win, it says which one was better? Was the linear model better or was the uh, decision tree better, okay? And in this case, did the decision tree win? It says uh, no, yes, no, 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 and so forth. So all I'm gonna do is I wanna find out how many times did the decision tree win? 
So I sum up all its wins, divided by the new row. 54% of the time, the decision tree won. It won 54% of all of the predictions. In other words, it was better 54% of the time over the linear model. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions? This is how you would determine whether the regression was better or a decision tree was better or any two or three models you wanna compare. You can compare things using different methods. Therefore, all you need to do is have a way to compare them. And in this case, I just basically used who was better and how many times. Does anybody have any questions? Is anybody still there? <laughs> All right, let me do this. Go ahead. Uh, Andy, you good? Andy, you good? I'm good. Okay, Kate, are you good? Kate Ponset? I'm good. G, are you good? Yes. Derek? Derek, are you good? Okay, Janie, are you good? Katie, are you good? Yep. Awesome, Matt, Mellis, are you good? Yes. Awesome, Michael, Nicole? Good. Okay, and Yuan, you good? Okay, does anybody have any questions on the homework or midterm that they want to ask? All right, I'm gonna kill the recording right now. We're, we're done for the evening. Um, again, I apologize that we, everything's gotta be online at this point, but we'll try to make the most of it. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. If you have any uh, thing that you think can make this experience better, please let me know and I'll try and do that. I'm going to do the best I can. Um.